You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art ed? Who tried to slice it? Who art ed? Mr. Wood art ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, it's I ambiguous. It works on so many levels. I know. That's off to great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and today we're going to be looking at Michelangelo. Now, an interesting little tidbit I learned as I was researching Michelangelo, he accumulated a massive amount of wealth. I mean, he, he would have been worth about $30 million today. But despite his considerable fortune, he was known to have lived a relatively Spartan life. I mean, he didn't dress himself in fancy clothes. In fact, he's said to have worn his work boots day and night. He slept in his boots. Which reminds me of another little fun fact I learned. His personal hygiene was bad even by 15th century standards. He seldom, if ever, bathed, and when he died, they actually had to cut and peel the clothing and boots off of him. But that would come later. During his lifetime, he sculpted, paint, and wrote poetry. He's largely considered to have been an ideal Renaissance man, and yet, in his poetry, he wrote that art left him, quote, poor, old, and working as a servant to others. But if he had a fortune equivalent to $30 million, why would he have felt that way? Let's start at the beginning. Michelangelo di Lodovico Buonarroti Simoni, I'm gonna try to never say that name again, was born in Capriz near Florence, Italy in 1475. His father was a banker, and shortly after Michelangelo was born, the family moved to Florence. Florence was a major center of trade and an economic powerhouse. Sadly, when Michelangelo was six, his mother died. His dad remarried a few years later, and Michelangelo was sent off to school to study grammar. The thing is, he didn't really care too much for studying grammar. He preferred to go down to the church and hang out with the artists and copy paintings. Something you need to understand here is there weren't a lot of people who could afford to pay for art. The church was one of the biggest patrons of the arts at the time, and they were hiring artists to create statues and paintings that would tell the stories of the faith, as well as making churches stunning and awe-inspiring for the people who came to worship. One of the artists Michelangelo met while he was neglecting his schoolwork was Domenico Ghirlandaio. Now, Gerlandeo was one of the greatest fresco painters of the day, and he was hired to paint the walls of the Sistine Chapel. Funny how the story almost goes sort of full circle, but Gerlandeo was considered a master of perspective and figure painting. And in 1488, at just the age of 13, Michelangelo started to apprentice under him. Just a year later, Michelangelo was a paid artist in Gerlandeo's studio. It was actually pretty rare for someone just 14 years old to be paid in in the artist's studio like that. But Michelangelo was an outstanding talent, even as an early teen. This was Florence, Italy in the 15th century. And aside from the church, there was another major patron of the arts, the Medici's. Now, Medici had founded a school, the Platonic Academy, and in 1489, he asked Ghirlandaio for two of his best pupils. Michelangelo was one of the two selected. Uh, He was there 1490 to 1492, so Columbus sailing the ocean blue and Michelangelo is going off to school. Uh, You know, those years in, in school, those formative years of your adolescence when you're 17 or 18, it leaves an impression on you. Now, in Michelangelo's case, that time literally left a mark on him. If you have looked at a portrait of Michelangelo, you might notice that his nose looks a little bit busted. Apparently, when he was 17 or 18, another young artist punched him in the face and broke his nose. The artist, Pietro Torgiano, was studying with Michelangelo. The two of them would go into the church and make copies of the frescoes. Some accounts say that Torgiano was jealous of Michelangelo's talent and he assaulted him. 
Torgiano's account was that Michelangelo was just always talking smack during their studies, and he just couldn't take it anymore. Regardless of the motivation, he described punching Michelangelo, quote, When he was annoying me, I got more angry than usual, and clenching my fist gave him such a blow on the nose that I felt the bone and cartilage go down like biscuit beneath my knuckles. This mark of mine he will carry with him to the grave. Torgiano had to flee Florence after that because Medici was furious and would have punished him quite severely. Of course, Torgiano was not the only artist that Michelangelo had run-ins with. Another famous Renaissance artist, uh, Raphael, was a rival. While to my knowledge, the two of them never came to blows, uh, it does appear that Raphael would give Michelangelo a hard time. Raphael was known to be a very fun-loving and charismatic guy, whereas Michelangelo was known to be kind of moody and brooding. Well, Michelangelo and Raphael were both hired by the same pope, Pope Julius II. And as Raphael was painting his, probably one of his most famous works, The School of Athens, he included a little depiction of Michelangelo. The thing is, he didn't depict Michelangelo as like Plato or Aristotle. He showed Michelangelo sitting off by himself on the steps as um, <laughs> as a lesser known philosopher known as the weeping philosopher. It's kind of a way of just like making fun of Michelangelo and his moodiness. As I said, Michelangelo and Raphael were both hired by Julius II. Now, the thing about Julius II was he was known as the warrior pope. He didn't take the name Julius as an homage to Julius I, a pope who came before him. He took the name Julius as a reference to Julius Caesar. And as a part of Pope Julius's mission to spread the Catholic faith and um, and his personal influence, he hired a number of artists like Raphael and Michelangelo to create works that would inspire awe as people looked upon the church. This is where we get to the famous Sistine Chapel. Initially, Julius just wanted Michelangelo to paint the 12 apostles on these triangular supports at the, at the top. They're called pendantives. Uh, Michelangelo was hesitant to take the job because, uh, for one, he considered himself to be more of a sculptor than a painter, although he had learned during his adolescence from one of the greatest fresco makers of the day. Also, the Pope had previously hired Michelangelo to design his tomb, and the two of them both just clashed. The two of them both had tempers and fought a lot during that project. Michelangelo reluctantly accepted the job after Pope Julius II gave him free reign on the project, along with the payment equivalent to about $600,000 today. Now, painting the ceiling in the Sistine Chapel was no small feat. As I said, the initial proposal was that he would paint the 12 apostles on the pendantives, but Michelangelo had other, other plans. He created this massive, sprawling work consisting of 300 figures laying out essentially the entire story of the Bible across 5,300 square feet. That's about 500 square meters for those who are not accustomed to measuring things in the average length of human appendages. In addition to the complexity of trying to lay out the story of the creation of Adam, the fall of man, the prophets, the genealogy of Jesus, all in one composition, he also had to contend with the arcs and the curved surface that he was painting on and really high up there. I mean, he had to get, it was, I think, 66 feet high at the peak. And he didn't like the scaffolding that they initially put in. Like, he didn't want to have ropes hanging from the ceiling because then he's got to paint around these ropes. He's got to contend with the holes and all of that that's going to affect the surface quality. And so he designed and built 
freestanding scaffolding that he would climb up. And I always had pictured him like laying on his back to paint this. But in actuality, he stood just craning his neck, looking up at the surface. So while it may not be like the the popular notion of, I think there might've been a movie that showed a dramatization of Michelangelo laying on his back atop the scaffolding and paint dripping on him and, and all of that misery as he's working. But in actuality, he was standing up, but don't worry, he was miserable the entire four years that he was working. He actually wrote a poem about how painful it was and included a little doodle in the margin illustrating it. So we do know he was standing up, craning his neck, extending his arm up, which if you think about it, it had to be quite the workout. Another thing that that made it quite the workout and just physically labor intensive, he's working as a fresco. See, the idea with the fresco is you've got wet plaster that you you paint into. And since the pigment is soaking into the plaster, it's going to hold up better over time. It becomes a part of the wall or a part of the, the ceiling or a part of the surface rather than something that's just painted on top of it. The thing about that is you have to keep going at a certain pace to to get it done. Like you have to just at the beginning of the day, put out the plaster that you're going to to paint into and you have to paint all of that before it dries at the end of the day. And when you're working with this, you have to be careful that you're not getting things too wet because, you know, mold issues and all of that. And apparently at one point, and there was an issue where the lime was too damp and mold did form, making the figures just unrecognizable. So partway through this project, he actually had to scrape and then repaint a certain section. But through all those challenges, he persisted and he created something that has endured and been revered for centuries. So I come back to that question from the beginning. Why did he feel that art left him poor, old, working as a servant to others? I think it's because he was a details guy, so fully invested in his work, he agonized over every square inch of those 5,300 square feet. And sometimes even great artists forget to step back and just enjoy the bigger picture. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted, part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. If you found this tolerable, please leave a rating or review on your favorite podcast app. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week on social media at Who Arted Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. And of course, on the website, whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.